Oktoberfest is probably the, the best way for us to celebrate all, that's, all that is special about Menlo. Alumni come, parents come, current students, and friends of the college. And the opportunity to show them the community spirit, the best of what's happening on campus, is something that, that I think inspires all of us who are part of Menlo community. And it's great to have so many of our alumni back. Yeah, you know, I think Oktoberfest is an opportunity for us to bring people together. You know, we talk about the family environment that we have to recruits, and we talk about the family environment that we have to our current students on a daily basis, but what does that really mean? And, you know, for me, it kind of sums it all up with Oktoberfest. You know, we bring alumni together, we bring parents of current students, prospective students, and of course our current students, staff and faculty. So really it kind of sums up what we say we are um, with all of our outreach, you know, and I really, I think it's an amazing weekend. Welcome to Oktoberfest 2020. My thanks to every one of you for joining us today. We started our Oktoberfest celebration in 2015 and it has been an annual tradition since then because it brings together our community across the decades in a way unlike any other. It is predictably one of my favorite days of the year and we're determined to continue the tradition even in the face of this global pandemic. While we are all missing each other, I'm hoping that the free beer today will help somewhat. One advantage of being a virtual is that we can welcome alumni from all over the world to connect with us here at this one moment in time. And for that, I am grateful. In just a moment, I will turn this over to Chris Garrett, class of 1994, who will be hosting us today for a tour and tasting at his renowned Devil's Canyon Brewery. Among other distinctions, Chris was the recipient of the Mendel College Outstanding Oak Award two years ago. That tradition continues today. The Outstanding Oak Award recognizes one alumnus each year for unwavering service to the college, strength of character, professional excellence, and selfless guidance of Menlo students. This year's recipient is truly one of a kind. She is known for her warmth and involvement through the decades by students, staff, faculty, and board members alike. She was one of the first alumni that I met when I joined Menlo back in 2013, and I have celebrated her continued support of all Oaks in the ensuing years. I'm very pleased to announce that the 2020 Outstanding Oak Award winner is Frances Mann Craig, class of 1976, and something of a marketing fairy godmother to a high-tech startups everywhere. Francis blends major corporate experience with passion, energy, and understanding of the life of an entrepreneur. Former Menlo College President Judge Russell put it into words perfectly when he told the then president, Jim Waddell, that Francis is a dynamic doer who doesn't fail when she undertakes a project. I think that's why she distinguishes herself to the extent that firms bid for her services and she keeps moving up. Those of you who know Francis, know that her warmth and enthusiasm are contagious and you'll see a flock of Menlo students surrounding her at every event. Since her time as a student here at Menlo, Frances has stayed actively involved. She has served on the Board of Trustees, she was the Chair of Menlo Alumni Council, and she's been an active participant of many student clubs and initiatives on campus. In recent years, she hosted the Women's Business Society's meetings at her home in the hills co-hosted a hit of a car show, and she has hired Menlo students as interns. Thank you, Francis, for your continued support and commitment to Menlo College. I'll say it time and time again, the Menlo College community is lucky to have you on our side. Congratulations once more, and my warmest personal thanks to you. Next on the program is what many of you are waiting for, drink in hand. So I'll turn it over to you, Chris Garrett. Again, my thanks to alumni everywhere for your support of your alma mater. Hi, I'm Chris Garrett. Welcome to 2020 Oktoberfest for Menlo College. It was just 29 years ago that I brewed my first beer at Menlo College as a student. Now I actually brew beer as a profession. I own Devil's Canyon Brewing Company here in San Carlos, California. Not only an alumni of Menlo College, but I also stand on the board of directors for the college 
and it's just a really great place that's near and dear to my heart. It pretty much made my career in the place that you see today. Um, today we're going to be talking about my company and the things that we do here in a sustainable way. We look at three different tenets. We look at economics, we look at the environment, and then of course social equity in our community and how we fit and balance into each of those tenets. As a result, we've won many awards. Um, we won the Sustainable San Mateo County Award. We also have a Green Business Award from the state. We also um, have it as fresh as it gets where we use local ingredients in our products that we sell to consumers. Secondarily, we work to find equipment and bring equipment from buildings into our facility. We work under a reuse model where we'll take equipment that's usually going to be thrown out and then we'll take that equipment, rebuild it, use it for ourselves. If it's not usable here, then we'll turn around and we'll give it or donate it to charitable organizations that need it. The third path for the equipment potentially is to sell it. Then the last, of course, is we trade items. So throughout our tour today, you'll see a lot of different examples of where we take equipment that should have been destroyed and rebuilt it, including the building I'm standing in that was originally Tesla. So Tesla was here last before us. They did a lot of the development on the S-Class and some of, the, some of the different roadster mechanisms, but there are vestiges throughout of their company here. But the building itself was effectively deemed unoccupable and we fixed it and we brought it back and used it just like we do everything else. You know, we're gonna move to the brew house now and I'll give you a tour and show you all the equipment and how we do what we do. Uh, about 90% of the infrastructure here was recycled from other facilities. Um, if you look here, this is our mash tun. Our mash tun basically converts carbohydrates to sugars and starches. It also adds the color and a lot of the flavor to the different beers that we make. We use all kinds of different grains from two row barleys to wheats to kiln grains that actually give us more of a kind of Meyer chocolatey effect, if you will. Then secondarily, we run from this machine into a kettle, and that kettle actually came from a dog food plant in the Midwest. It was to be thrown away effectively. They used it for brewer's yeast to actually extract out all the vitamin B complex for dog food. Uh, we brought that in, rebuilt it, and put it in place. But that's our kettle where we actually boil off all of the impurities and things that are in the, in the beer and then add hops to it, not only as a preservative, but for aroma and a lot of flavor. And we also kill off any bacteria that might be in it during the process. If you look here, the platform is an amalgamation of parts and pieces that come from all over. We have stuff from Diageo, which was a Jose Cuervo plant that was being torn down locally. Also from Genentech, um, which Roche and Genentech, and then Novartis, uh, Bear Pharmaceuticals. We built this thing out of pieces from all over the place. So it's a great platform, but you can see it's totally functional and safe, and it's junk, but it's not. Anyway, if you kind of look around the room, you'll see a lot of other components, including a rock star brewer over there. Um, you see this shower head here, that's a chemical shower. We traded a bunch of garbage effectively to a salvage yard for that device. So we really never throw much away. We'll actually go trade for different items that would normally just be thrown away. And it's, it's just a really great way to do business for us. So then you look here, this is from the, a brewery in the Midwest. This is actually a piece that was going to be thrown out. It was, had a fractured steam jacket on it. We were able to put in an external steam system. We built the whole piece and put it back together. Costs us a lot less money, works a whole lot better, and it's a whole heck of a lot better for the environment. The third component there, again, we talked about the economic, the environment. The social equity piece is what we employed local people, taught them trades and skills to be able to work on this equipment. Continuation of looking at our facility, as you look around, you'll see a lot of different components that come from all over. For example, our walk-in cooler was, were pieces and panels that were destined for landfill. We went in and rebuilt the entire walk-in cooler. We took it a step further and actually run the whole walk-in cooler off of a glycol system so it's a whole lot more efficient. So from a sustainability standpoint, it's, you can't do much better. So let's take a look at that. This walk-in cooler houses about half of our products and, and a lot of our hops. You can see there, pretty cool. What we have here are T90 hops. 
This is a Tetnanger type hop. Mm, great aromatics. We use this primarily as a bittering hop, surprisingly. But when we put it in the kettle that I showed you earlier, it actually disintegrates almost entirely. So that compact hop that was once a flower has been pressed into just a little pellet. We're going to walk into the brewing part of the facility where we actually do our fermentation. So you, the first thing we did was we extracted the sugars and created either sugars or starches in our mash tun. And that dictates the percentage of alcohol effectively or how big and body full a beer is. We went to the kettle. And we're gonna, we heated that up to over 212 degrees Fahrenheit. We transfer that through a cooling system over to these tanks over here, where we'll actually start our fermentation. And so in the fermentation, we'll add in some yeast. The yeast go to work on the sugar. They generate more yeast, ethanol, and CO2, so you have carbonation. If you kind of look around, you'll see most of the infrastructure overhead, that came out of other buildings, all over the Bay Area and even beyond. So about 90% of that infrastructure that supports this tank farm came from other facilities. So when you see a tank that has a conical shape to it, that's primarily called a unitank or a fermenter. That's where we actually ferment the beer. We'll take it from there into a bright tank. You see a flat bottom tank like these over here. That's where we'll package off of. We'll carbonate into the tank to bring up more CO2 than was actually made. And then we'll package like here, this is a bottling line. One of our bottling lines we'll be running today. We're running off some of the uh, amber ale that you guys will be trying here in a minute. If you kind of look here, there's a big filtration system. We also filter some of the beers, not all. The uh, trends now are more hazy IPAs, which we'll be trying one of those, which is our spare the air. That beer doesn't even see filtration. It just goes straight through. We can make it a whole lot more quickly, but it costs a whole lot more because pounds per barrel of hops is about four to five X. And we're, our hop costs are roughly in the neighborhood of about $14 to $23 per pound. So pretty interesting. As we kind of continue through here, we're going to see things like a big boiler system. Our boiler runs all of our steam for our steam plant. This boiler came out of a school in the Midwest and it was effectively defunct. It was non-working. We brought it back, rebuilt it because it had grown uh, limestone deposits. We put some acids in it, removed the limestone, and we received this perfectly good boiler for very little cost. So we saved on many levels, pretty neat. Same thing goes for all of our air systems, which are in this room over here. We have really amazing air compressors. Those came from other buildings. We're able to build a part shop. We now have more fasteners than Home Depot and that came from different buildings where people were going to throw out their MRO supply system equipments. And we were able to retrieve that stuff. And that's how we built the entire place that you see here today. Part of our sustainability efforts are not only in recovering things, but also in testing new and kind of different ideas. We've tested anaerobic digestion systems uh, where we'll take spent grain, because today most of our grain goes to feed cattle and chickens. We were looking for an alternative output for that to keep it away from landfill and potentially keep it away from what is now thousands of years relationship between farmers where we saw issues with greenhouse gases from some of the animals and then also from the travel to actually move that grain to those places. We're in a very non-rural setting. To get to a cow is at least, you know, 45 minutes or so away. So that's not great for the environment. So we looked at alternative uses for the grain we found that we could build an anaerobic digestion system to generate gas and we tested it, found that it doesn't necessarily work very well for grain, but it works great for food. As a result, that system now is in Anaheim and it's running food for different parks and things and generating gas, which is then burned for all kinds of things. So what we're seeing here is our new solar canopy that we installed last year. We work with a local company and a local union group, the IBEW, to build out this entire array. It effectively produces about 80 to 85% of our current usage. And it offers us an outdoor beer garden environment. Typically on a Friday night, pre-COVID, we would see between 750 to 2,000 people in a night. On a weekly basis for just our private events, it's between 3,500 and 4,000 people a week. Now we don't see anybody, <laughs> but that'll change soon. So we're looking forward to that. You can kind of see some of the other things that we've done around here. We built 
a bar years ago out of a defunct shipping container. We cut the sidewall out and built the entirety out of junk, effectively. And some recycled old panels, some old stainless that we found in a building. We built this whole thing, including the wood, which came from a house in Menlo Park, which I'll show you more of inside. As you talking about wood, all the wood around our beer garden is clear vertical grain heart redwood that we took out of a bank in Belmont that was being torn down last year. Basically, we have friends that call us and say, hey, they're tearing this stuff down. You guys got to have this stuff. And so we go get it. We redo it, turn it into effective furniture. I mean, to buy something like that, if you could find it, would cost you a fortune. But now we have this wonderful furniture grade redwood in our outdoor beer garden. It's pretty amazing. Next thing that we have here is our food trailer. That came from the government. It was a defunct food trailer they'd use for baseball games. And we brought that in, wrapped it, rebuilt it. We just finished actually putting in a uh, fire suppression system. We're gonna deploy that here in the next few weeks when we reopen. We'll be reopening on October the 4th on Sundays during our farmer's market, which was another piece of our community outreach and social equity, to actually bring the community together into a common space during these tough times. But well, we do that every Sunday here, but we'll be opening to sell beer every Sunday from here on out on the 4th. So during COVID, we've had to do a lot of pivoting in our business. One of the things that we've done is to actually make hand sanitizer. So we've been outfitting the police departments, the fire departments, a lot of the first responders from the beginning, early March, we were actually producing this for just about everyone. It's been in hospitals, it's been all over. We do sell it on our website, so please go buy some if you'd like some. But uh, it's necessary for us to pivot in order to stay in business. Those are techniques that I actually learned at Menlo. Um, we've done many other things. We started home delivery, um, started pickups. Like I said earlier, we've done the farmer's market. But the reality here, guys, is that I couldn't do this all alone. Menlo College has a wonderful internship program, and as a result, I have great support. So both Kenzie here and Janae were Menlo College students that came to us as interns. Now they work for us full time, and they support all of our marketing efforts. Everything you see comes from these two folks here, and they do a fantastic job. As a reward today, they're going to drink beer with me. So let's go ahead and get started on trying some beer, okay? The first thing we want to try today is our root beer. A little story on that one. We used to go to all these beer festivals, and the challenge we had was, you know, you go to a beer festival and you drink too much. And when you're trying to work a beer festival, that's not really great to drink so much. So we said, can we come up with an alternative beverage that we can look like we're drinking with the rest of the folks and still have a good time and not get absolutely intoxicated? So my wife, Christiane, and I came up with some root beer. We did about five or six recipes to start, found the one we liked, and then took it out to one of the festivals and started drinking it. Next thing you know, someone walks by and says, is that root beer that I smell? I said, well, yeah, I'm drinking root beer. And they're like, well, can we have some? Next thing you know, we had a line of like 40 people deep and everyone wanted our root beer. Well, so now the root beer, which is handcrafted, uses honey, some local ingredients, agave. It's wonderful stuff. Now it's one of our best sellers. We sell more of this than a lot of the beers. Surprisingly, during COVID though, this is the first time we've packaged it. We actually brought this into a package and started to put it into a can. So we now sell it in a can because it used to only be draft. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you a can. I'll get a can. And by the way, we are socially distanced, but we're, we've been together as a team since March. So at this point, <laughs> we're just together. So anyhow, so we're gonna try some root beer and talk about it. I might actually put one of these guys on the spot and see if they can use their marketing skill that they learned from Menlo to describe what they're tasting. Mmm. <laughs> do you smell the sarsaparilla and mint? I do. I get a lot of the sarsaparilla. There you go. Has a little bit of wintergreen in it, a little bit of mint, some sarsaparilla. The cool thing about this is that we use cane sugar. We don't use any high fructose corn syrup. Um, so it's really, really tasty. Also, the, the honey and the gave give it that sharp, nice sweetness that you would have had from the corn syrup. Mm. So for you guys that are trying this today, I know that there's a lot of folks that are waiting to try the beer and they don't have the root beer. I'm trying to make you jealous, so maybe you'll order some and you can try some in the future. The other point too is that almost every event that we do at Menlo College, you'll see this root beer there. We bring it out for all kinds of stuff, for the TEDx events, for the different uh, three-day startup weekends, 
all kinds of events this shows up for the luau. Um, so when you're on campus, we hope soon, you can try some of this fantastic root beer. So Janae, tell me what you think about the root beer. Honestly, this is the best root beer in all of California. It's the best root beer I've ever tasted. Um, it's not too sweet. It has the perfect amount of bubble of carbonation and the aroma from it is my favorite part, I think. That's awesome. See, that's why she works here. She's awesome. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway, let's jump. <laughs> no, we love Janae. She's amazing. So we're going to jump into their next beer on the list here, which is our dedicated amber ale. This recipe is the recipe that I first brewed 29 years ago at Menlo College in a house that we had right next to the college, right by the soccer field. If you guys remember behind Bronner Hall, there was a Victorian house there. There were about nine of us that rented that house. And uh, a good buddy of mine, Andy Baugh, and I brewed some beer out of there. At one point, I think we brewed somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, four or 500 gallons out of that house. It was pretty fantastic. We threw some amazing parties. As you can probably all remember, Menlo was known for for quite a while. But this beer originally was brewed effectively almost as an IPA. It was to represent the beer that would have been brewed at the time of IPAs. If you notice, it's a whole lot more tawny in color has more of a kind of copper color to it. We, we think of that in terms of what woods were available at the time to kiln the wood or to kiln the grain to help it germinate. Um, if you think most of the woods in the region there in England had been pretty much decimated. So it was a bunch of junk old wood, so you had a lot of smoky character to it. And so we wanted to replicate that in this beer. It has a lot of the amber color. And of course now we just call it an amber. It has Cascade hops in it, 5.4% mm. 5, 5, 5 alcohol. Picking up a lot of that citrus note, grapefruit. Mm. It's fantastic. All right, Kenzie, tell me what you think. This one's honestly in my top three favorites. Okay. Um, I think just because it is so well balanced and the flavor is really nice with the malt. What would you drink it with? Oh, I would drink this with anything. Okay. All right. Yeah. I think the citrus really works well personally. I, you know, I just love it with Mexican food. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely just love it. Uh, yeah. You know, I, fish tacos are wonderful with it because it just has that citrus bite to it, that really nice, you know, whole citrus thing going on. I just love that. So, I don't know. I think it's a fantastic beer. Well balanced. Let's have another sip. What are your thoughts, Janae? I think it has a really nice finish, a very smooth mm -hmm. and flavorful finish, but it's not too much. You're picking up those roasted malts? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> Great. So we'll transition now over to our West Coast Hazy IPA. You know, you, you see a lot of Northeast IPAs right now, and the Northeast kind of movement you had a lot more kind of uh, aromatic bubble gums and mangoes and fruitiness. This one has some of that, but it kind of sticks more to the hops that are in it, which we carry in to this beer, a Simcoe hop, a Citra hop, and a Mosaic. So we're balancing the three. So it's a little bit more West Coast than East Coast as far as uh, hazy IPAs go. Um, obviously, Spare the Air is the name of the beer, and it's definitely, uh, oh, we should have talked about dedicated in the name, shouldn't have we? Yeah. Sure. So I was a Grateful Dead fan. There you go. Dedicated. So there you go. So Spare the Air, though, is really more about our sustainability movement and the things that we do within the brewery. And that's where we picked the LA skyline and showed some of the haze behind it. And hopefully, uh, with all the fires recently, you can kind of relate. So this beer should, should pour pretty darn hazy. It tends to hold pretty well. And, the, and what we're really looking for in this beer is the aromatics. We're looking for that nose, and we're going to pick up mm, all that yumminess. Okay, this one's you. You've got it. Tell me all about it. Yeah? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, well, instantly, as soon as you crack open the can, you get a big whiff of all of the hops, a lot of the citrus notes and mm -hmm. the aromatics. So that's honestly my favorite part of this beer, um, is not even getting to the taste, but once you do get there. <laughs> How much alcohol is in this one, do you know? This one is 6.7%. That's right. See? Marketing students, it. they know everything. <laughs> mm. 
but this one's also one of my favorites. Um, mm -hmm. It's really nice and medium bodied. You get a lot of the citrus flavors on the body as well. Um, a lot of orange. Picking up a lot more grapefruit. That's what's making it more of a West Coast than an East Coast. So you're getting that grapefruit kind of meets a little bit of lime almost. Mm -hmm. I'm getting some pine in there too. Mm -hmm. Pulling in some really nice pine elements. Uh, the citra does that to some degree, but it's not overly pine. So it's not r super piney, but it's just reminding you it's a West Coast beer. Janae, tell me what do you think? With this one, again, my favorite part is the aroma from the hops. Okay. And it has like a slightly hop bitterness to the finish, I think. Yeah. And it tastes really good. Yeah, cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, those are our beers today. I hope you guys enjoyed them, and I hope you enjoyed the tour. Um, we definitely look forward to seeing you guys back on campus for Oktoberfest, hopefully next year. And then in the meantime, if we're able to have any other events at the campus, you'll see us there for sure. For example, we have an event coming up this coming, well, we have, we have one that's soon, I think, that we'll be showing up for. So hopefully we'll be on campus and we'll see you all out there. Thanks for joining us today. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>